All right. Well, well, well. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hey, this is the day that the Lord have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for tuning in to In the Backyard with Pastor Perryman. Hey, today is a beautiful day. It's an exciting day. Man, it's a sunny day. Most of all, <laughs> it's a Wednesday. It's a beautiful day here. Let me give a big shout out to those of you who are watching me on Instagram and those of you who are watching me on Facebook Live. Shout out to Miss Jennifer Smith. She's the first one on today. Got to give you my pound, sweetheart. Shout out to Miss Edna Powell. Shout out to my cousin Robert Perryman, who's on this morning. Good to see you. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Y'all do me a favor. Make sure you share, you like, you tag, you invite. Get other people to come on and be a part of In the Backyard with Pastor Perryman, all right? Shout out to my guy, Kaylin Kenner Bruce. Shout out to Miss Michelle McClung. Shout out to Miss Juanita Carter. Shout out to Salilo Jones. It's a pleasure to have you with us this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We appreciate you. Hey, my wife, Pastor Sophia, is on this morning. Good to see you. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Man, it feels so good to be back in the backyard again. It really does. So, hey, you know, for two weeks we couldn't be back here because of all of the wind blowing and the rain. But we're here again today, and that's a beautiful thing. Shout out to Miss Shirley Powell. Shout out to Miss Bam. Good to see you. Thank you so much for being on. Hey, my beautiful daughter, Ashley Perryman, is rocking with us this morning. Shout out to you, sweetheart. Love you. And my grandsons, good to see you. Shout out to you, Ron. Good to see you. Hey, my son, my, my, my firstborn is on today. Shout out to my son, Darius Pierre Buckley, who's rocking with us this morning. Good to see you, son. Hey, shout out to Mr. Ivy Loggins, who's on today. Miss Cassandra James Moore is on today. Shout out to you. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. Listen, y'all do me a favor. Share, like, tag, invite. Start a, start a watch party. Get other people to come on and be a part of In the Backyard with Pastor Perryman. Today is going to be an exceptional day. It's the first day of the month. Man, it's a new month. It's a new chapter. But we are pressing and moving forward in the things of God. Hey, shout out to my little brother, Timothy Price, who's on this morning. Shout out to you, man. Appreciate you so much for tuning in today. I appreciate you. But listen, let's get into it today. Let's get into it. And uh, hey, get your coffee, your juice, your tea, or whatever you're drinking. Get it this morning. It's going to be amazing today, all right? Shout out to Miss Shannon Goosby, who's on this morning. Good to see you. Thank you so much for tuning in. So let's get to it. You know, uh, back in 1999... Had given my life to Christ, and uh, one of the most exciting times of my life was when I surrendered my entire life to Christ. That I wasn't playing anymore; that I was on, I would be on fire for God. Hey, Miss Harriet Anderson, good to see you. I never forget after being saved, my brother and I, Minister Kim Simmons, is on. Hey, but my brother and I used to sit in the car in Gardena. I uh, mean, after, you know, we sit in the car after we had gotten saved, but we sit in the car. This is when we had moved to Gardena. And, man, we would talk for hours and talk for hours on what God would do. Actually, this is before we moved to Gardena. This is actually doing when I was living in Long Beach. We would talk for hours about what we would do for God and the dreams and the desires that we had to do things for God. i never forget one night I'm sitting in the car. And he says something to me that stood out to me, haven't forgotten it to this day. When he first became a member of the church uh, that I had gotten saved in, he said that he was sitting down talking to the pastor. And uh, he and his wife at that time were not married, they had a son already, I believe. And they sat down together and the pastor was talking to him about life. And the pastor at that time started to tell him that life is about decisions. It's about the choices that you make. If you're going to be a minister, then choose to marry this young lady. And so here he is. He's talking to him. Talk, she's talking to him about life is about decisions and the choices that you make. When I listened to him talk, I started to think as he was talking that every area of my life has been affected by the choices that I have made. There may be many of you who are watching me today that who are starting to think, too, that every area of my life is affected by the choices that I have made. Nobody made me get married. Nobody made me uh, uh, buy this car. Nobody made me buy this house. Nobody made me get connected to this person. Nobody made me do it. It was a choice that I made. It was a choice that you made. Life is about the choices that we make. In this season that we're in right now, you have a choice. A choice really is a life option. It's a life choice option. You have an option today. You have a choice today. You can choose to either be happy or you could choose to be sad. You could choose to be frustrated or you could choose to live a joyous life. It's up to you. You can choose to wait on the stimulus package 
uh, you can choose to be prosperous right now. It's up to you. The Bible says it like this. That God says, I set before you this day, blessings and cursing, life and death. And then here's what he says. He says, choose life that you may live. So watch now. Every one of us is faced with life choice options. You can either choose to make it in life or you could choose to miss it in life. The choice is yours. Can't nobody make you choose something? Can't nobody make you do this? Can't nobody make you do that? Not even God can make you choose. But what he can do is give you an option and then give you the answer to the test that he just gave you. And that is to choose life. So the choice is yours. What are you choosing today? Are you choosing to be prosperous in this season? Are you choosing to be happy in this season? Are you choosing to be unhappy in this season? Are you choosing to be your best in this season? Or are you choosing to do something else? See, watch now. My life cannot be shaped by the circumstances or the situation that I'm facing. Okay, well, what do you mean my life can't be shaped? What I'm talking about is my life cannot go in the direction. I cannot allow my life to go into the direction of the way the world is thinking in this season. I have a choice in the matter. And the choice is I choose to live by faith and not by sight. I choose to glorify God in this season, even though I don't know how things are going to turn around, even though I don't know how this is going to work and that's going to work. But what I choose to do is to give God glory in this season. The choice is yours. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to act like the world in panic? Are you going to lose your mind? Are you going to let fear set in and rule your life? Are you going to allow fear to take everything away from you? Or are you going to choose to just give God glory and to honor God in this season? Are you going to choose to still work the principles of God? Are you going to make the decision that I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to hoard? I'm going to hold back. I'm not going to do what I'm supposed to do. Or are you going to make the decision that you're still going to glorify God in this season? The choice is yours. The Bible tells us the story of 2 Kings chapter number 7. That here there was a famine being in the land now because of the Syrian. The Syrian army has now surrounded the city of the Sumerian city, has surrounded it. And the Bible says that the prophet comes out and tells them that flour is going to be sold, going to be sold at an astronomical price. Everything is going up in the famine. Everything is going up. People are at a point now where... There's no more food to eat, so they're eating up the horses, and there are only a few horses left. People are eating eating dung. In other words, they're, they're, eating, they're eating theses and stuff like that because they got nothing else to eat. And all of a sudden, the man of God comes along and tells them that, man, there's about to be a change in this situation. Now, what's the change that they're talking about? It said, listen, everything that was so expensive is about to become dirt cheap now. The people are looking. They don't know how this thing is going to work out. But they don't know that there's four lepers who, who are in a situation where they got to make a choice. And they said, if we sit here, we're going to die. Why sit we here and die? If we just get up and make a decision to go be with the Syrians, perhaps they will save us. If they don't, we're going to die. If we get up from here and go into the city, we're going to die. They faced with a choice, and guess what they did? They chose to get up from their situation and go to the Syrian army. When they got to the Syrian army, they found out there was nobody there. Everything that they, was, they, they needed was there. Nobody was there because God had caused the people to run away, caused the armies to run away and leave everything behind. So now all of a sudden, they're sitting there. They find there's clothes here, there's money here, there's food here. And they're about to eat it all up for themselves, and then they make a decision like, we can't do this. What we got to do now is take what we have and go share with somebody else. It's a choice that they made. What are you going to do in this season? Are you going to sit in your situation and die where you are? Are you going to make a decision that you're just going to do what you know to be right, that you're going to do what is right, that you're going to come up out of this situation, you're going to come up out of this circumstance, and you're going to choose to do what is right. I made a decision that I'm going to choose to do right. The choice is mine. The choice is yours. Every one of us is faced with a life choice option. What are you going to do? For some of you, your choices, you look at them every day and you become discouraged by the choices that you have made. You're where you are today because of the choices that you have made. For some, now, when you look at your children, you're frustrated now because you know that's a decision that you made. And the decision that you made means that the daddy is not around anymore. So you're faced with that choice every day. It doesn't mean that the children are bad, but you're looking at yourself and seeing the bad decision that you made because you knew off the bat he was not the right one. You knew off the bat that he was not the one for you. But guess what you did? You still chose to be with the individual anyway, knowing, knowing that it was not the right decision. And so here's what happened. Every decision that you make 
<laughs> every choice you make have consequences and repercussions attached to it. So now all of a sudden you wake up every morning and you look at the decision that you made. There's nothing wrong with the children, but they remind you of the decision that you made. It's a choice you made. Nobody can make you do anything else. It's a choice that you made. So every day when you look at your house, you see it's a decision that you made. You live where you live because of the decision that you made. It's not based on the economy. It's not based on the education that you have. It's not based on the money that you have in your bank. It's a choice that you made. You have to make a decision. Listen to this. If you get up and start to make a decision, then God will start to add to your life because of a decision that you made. There's no way possible I'm supposed to live in this house in the natural. Because credit scores say I can't be here. Money says I can't be here. You understand other things says I can't be here. But the Bible says if God be for us, who can be against us? So I had to make a decision. And everything hinges and starts with a decision that you make. What decision are you going to make? Are you going to make the decision to stay in the ghettos your entire life? Are you going to make the decision that you're going to stay on Section 8 your entire life? Are you going to make the decision that you're going to live together and not be married all of your life? Are you going to make a decision that things are going to be different with you? You have to make a life choice decision. A life choice decision does not just affect you. But it affects those who are connected to you. If you stay in the same situation, you will begin to train other people who are connected to you to stay right there. And so guess what they'll do? They'll stay right there because you train them to live there. You train them to get over there. You train them to manipulate there. You train them how to live in a chaotic situation. And so now all of a sudden, guess what they're doing? Passing it down to the next generation because of a decision you made. Every decision you make is not based on you. It is based on what will take place with other people when it's time to make decisions in the home. And I'm confused and I don't know what to do. I can go get information from other people. I can go research in information. I can go call people for advice. But at the end of the day, the choice is mine. So I sit down and I realize that I cannot make a decision based on me. All right. Let me give you an example. When, when it was time for us to start looking for cars, Rev wanted a car that, that, that really going to fit me. You understand? I'm, I'm going to the car dealership. I'm looking at cars that I really like. They're really going to fit me. But the reality is I can't buy a car that's going to fit me. I have to buy a car that's going to fit we. I, I know that's not proper English, Byron Williams, but give me a moment. I have to buy a car that's going to fit we, that's going to fit us. And if I'm a bio car that's going to fit we, if I'm a bio car that's going to fit us, I have to get us approval on. I have to get we approval on. Who's the we? My wife, I got to hear what she got to say on this because this car is not about me. It's about us. It's about we. And so here I am. I'm looking at this Cadillac Escalade. I want it. We had one before. I want this Escalade. It's the kind I want. This thing is about a hundred and some thousand dollars. I want this car. I'm looking at it, and the guy's telling us, yeah, you you guys can get this. You guys qualify. So here I am. I'm looking for this thing. I ain't thinking about how long it's going to take me to pay it off. I ain't thinking about the car payment on it. And my wife comes along. She says, honey, I don't like that car. It's too big for us. I said, but we had one already. We had one of these. And it was good. That, that car took us wherever we needed to go. We put 200,000 miles on this vehicle. This is a good vehicle. You know it. It's comfortable for the family. And then she said, well, honey, we can't park it in the garage. It's too big to park in the garage. I'm looking like, hmm, okay, she got a point right there. She says, and then on top of that, honey, this car is going to be well over $2,000 a month. You got a really big point there. She watch now. The decision that needed to be made was not a decision based on me personally, but it was a life choice decision that needed to be made for all of us. So now here I am. I got a different perspective on this thing, and I got to say to the, the salesman, nah, it's okay. We don't want that one. And he's pressing. He's pressing. You you could get it. You could get it. No, we don't want it. So now all of a sudden now we go look at a different car, and I'm seeing this Jaguar F-Type, beautiful enough room for us because my daughter treasure is the litmus test if she could fit in the back seat and have some room then that's a car that's big enough for the family so here i am i'm telling my wife this is it, this is it right here look at this and we going around and i'm all in it car's nice my daughter's in it act like she can drive and we want it and we want it and then my wife says i don't like this car i don't like this car i'm like what you don't like this car look this is within our budget we could do this and i don't i don't like this car honey i don't like this car 
And then I said, all right, well, I guess we can't buy it. And my daughter's like, get it, daddy, get it, get it anyway. Don't forget what mama say, get this car anyway. No, I'm not going to do that because if I make the decision to buy this car, now I got to deal with the consequences in my home. And the consequences in my home is she going to be angry and upset with me. She's going to be mad with me. And so now she's going to be connected to a car that she don't like. So I had to make a decision. We're not doing that. Go to another car lot and we're looking at another car and this Mercedes E350. I'm looking at, this is it. This is it. And then I get in the car and the car's not big enough. And my wife was like, honey, this is not big enough for us. And I'm just scratching my head like, oh my God, if we could do this one, we could do this one. And no, this is not big enough for us. And I got to take a step back because if I get the car, She's not going to be happy with it because it doesn't fit us as a family. And so I had to realize that the decision that we make is not about me, but it's about we. It's about us. Every decision that you make, every choice you make have consequences and repercussions attached to it. What are you going to do? Are you just going to make a decision because you want to, because it's beneficial for you? Or is it a decision that you're going to make that's beneficial for all of us? There are people, that, that there's an individual that we know who went out and bought himself a Corvette. Car only got two seats and they ain't got no other car, but he bought a Corvette. I work hard. I should have got, I can have whatever I want. But brother, y'all don't have, y'all have a family of five. The car got two seats. How y'all going to get to where you need to go? You are not thinking. And so now you are stuck with a car for five years and your family is uncomfortable because you made a decision that was best for you, but not best for the family. So you have to understand that decisions we make are life-changing. They are life-altering. They don't just affect you, but they affect generations to come. You are where you are today because of a decision that you made. I remember one time God is speaking to me while I'm in the middle of my service preaching one Sunday. And God tells me, tell the people that it's time for them to go look for their homes. And I prophetically speak and nobody pays attention to me. And I'm speaking prophetically that God said it's time to go look for your home. And everybody's not saying anything. They're just looking at me crazy when service is over with. Some of them come to me, Pastor, how are we going to look for a home? I, I, God, God told me to stay over in this community for all these years. I'm supposed to pray for the people over here. How am I supposed to look for a home? God, God, I can't afford to buy no home. And I'm saying to them, God didn't tell you you had to pay for it. He told you to go look for it. If he told you to go look for it, that means he's going to provide for you. Well, well but, but I'm supposed to pray for the people. You can pray for the people living in another place. There is no distance between prayer. So nobody moves. Next Sunday, I'm preaching, and these people walk into our church. We've never seen them before. And these were people now who was part of President Obama's regime, and their job was to help people in low-income neighborhoods get new homes. And they asked me, could they have some words to say? I let them stand up and speak. They express and explain that they were from President Obama's cabinet and their job was to help people with low income get homes. And all of a sudden, the people is looking and nobody is paying attention. Nobody is moving. Nobody is reaching out to them at the service. They got their cards, passing it out to people. and Nobody is paying attention. Nobody wants it because everybody's mindset is wrapped up to this. So now I still have some people in my church who are still living in the ghettos because they didn't make a decision. They didn't make a choice to follow the plan that God has for them. And so now all of a sudden, they're right where they are right now because of a decision that they did not make. Listen to this. When God provides an opportunity for you, go through the door. When God opens up a door for you, go it, go through it. When he provides an opportunity for you, take it. When he sets before you an open door, don't hesitate to walk through it. Walk through the door. That means he has opened it. That means he's providing for you. That means he's covering you. He's caring for you. He knows it's on the other side. He would not open the door or present an opportunity for you if he was not prepared to take care of you. It's important for us to understand this, that the choice is yours. I often think about where my life would have been had my mama not made the choice to move from Itabina to California. I often wonder, would I, would I still be a preacher today? Would my, mind, would my life be different? Would my attitude be different? Where would I be today? And my mom sometimes tells me that, Chris, you may, not have, you may not be who you're supposed to be had that decision not been made. See, God knows everything about us. He knows where we're supposed to be. When we are supposed to be there, he knows. He knows how we are supposed to get there. 
He knows what vehicle, what tools to use to get you there. He knows. And so sometimes God will move you when a tragedy strikes. <laughs> Let me say it again. Sometimes God will move you when a tragedy strikes. A tragedy hits and God moves you. You look at the tragedy as being lost. But God shows you it's an opportunity for you to be able to move to your next. It's a door being closed in many cases. Sometimes we don't like to look at it like that, but it's a door being closed. There was nothing else for my mom to live there for. Nothing against the people that I grew up with. Love my town. Love my town a thousand percent. Love my town. Wouldn't be who I am without my town. It played a major role in who I am. But the doors had started to close for my mother. Her mother was dead. Her father has just died. There was no more opportunities for her. So guess what he had to do? He had to show her that it was time for her to move on. We would not be who we are today had we not moved. I would not have met the wife that I have today if I had not, my mother had not moved. I would not have the children that I have today had my mother not moved. All of these things are tied together. You can see through that analogy that one person's decision can affect a generation. Had my mother not made the decision to leave, I wouldn't have the children that I have today. Wouldn't have the house that I have today. Wouldn't have the wife that I have today. Wouldn't have any of the experiences that I have today had my mother not made the decision to move. Sometimes we look at things from the wrong perspective, not seeing that God knows exactly what he's doing. Not understanding, not knowing that God is with us in our decisions. So everything we do is based on a decision. You went to jail. It wasn't because somebody made you go. It was because of the decision that you made. You got connected to him. It was not because somebody made you get connected to him. It was because of a choice that you made. You didn't have to, but you did. You didn't choose. You didn't have to do this, but you did. You didn't have to go there, but you did. And there's always consequences attached to a decision that you make. But it's up to you today to choose now what you want to do with the rest of your life. For those of you who are sick in your physical body, you have an option today. You can choose to be healed or you can choose to be sick. It's up to you. For those of you right now who, who don't have a job because of this coronavirus, you have an option. You can choose to be happy or you can choose to be sad. You can choose to have the woe is me mentality or you can choose to rejoice in the Lord. The choice is yours. What are you going to do? For those of you right now who have been connected to the wrong man for all of these years and all of a sudden a relationship ended, you can choose to get your life back. Or you can choose to let your life die because you went through a divorce. The choice is yours. What are you going to choose today? There are people today whose, whose husband died and they have moved on. There's people today whose wife has died and they have moved on. I'm not telling you you need to move on 15 minutes after she's gone or 20 minutes after he's gone. Boo, it's been 15 years now. How long are you going to sit here? Are you going to sit here and die in this present condition? Are you going to make a decision that you're going to move on with your life and you're going to get your joy back? You're going to get your happiness back. You're going to get your peace back. For many of you today, you need to sit down and have a meeting with yourself and ask yourself the question, self, am I in this situation because of a choice that I made? Am I here because of me? And you're going to answer you. The choice is yours. What are you going to do today? Are you going to sit here to live your entire life on, on Section 8, your entire life? maneuvering around just to stay in a box. I'm talking to people today who are on welfare today. Nothing against you being on welfare because Reverend was on welfare at one time. I'm not, I wasn't getting GR, but I was getting AFDC. I was getting a monthly check every, every month because I was a single parent at that moment with my son, Darius Pierre Buckley. He's a witness to it. I was getting a check of 700 and some dollars a month and 300 and some dollars worth of food stamps every month. So I understand I'm not criticizing or putting anybody down, but you need to understand uh, that the system is designed to keep you in a box. You can only go so far, but you're still in a box. And so you have to make a decision. Am I going to stay in the box? Or am I going to destroy the box and live outside of it? The choice is yours. If you make the decision to stay in the box, then there are limitations that are now placed on you because you are in the box. What's the limitation if I'm on Section 8? I can't really have my husband living with me because if I do, I got to add him. To my voucher. And if I add them to my voucher, my rent going up, my lease going up, it, it, I, I can only have a certain amount of apartments. I can only have a certain amount of bedrooms. I can only live in certain neighborhoods. I can only, everything becomes limited to me. But I've learned how to maneuver and to stay in the box. The choice is yours. What do you choose to do today? 
You can choose to live your life in the box or you can choose to live outside of the box. You can choose to destroy the box. The choice is yours. If you destroy the box, then you will see God move in your life on a whole nother level. You will see him do the miraculous. When we made the decision that we were going to move from Gardena to the move into Palmdale. It started out as just me looking online for a place to live. My wife and, and child, my wife and daughter have been talking about now it's time for us to have a house, Daddy. My daughter saying, Dad, I need to have my own bedroom. I need to have my own bedroom. And I'm looking at this situation that everything is starting to get tight in the house. No more room. And when my kids would come to visit, we ain't really got a lot of room. And, and I'm looking at this thing. It's time for us to get up out of here. It's time for us to move. And I'm praying and asking God to give us a place. And I go online and I'm putting in on Zillow about a house. And I'm just playing around about moving into Palmdale. That we wasn't serious about that. That was just some things. I put in that I wanted a big five bedroom house. I wasn't really looking for that. That was a joke. I wasn't playing. I was playing around. But then all of a sudden the doors start to open. And so here we are, presented with this opportunity to move into this house. And I'm about to squander it. Because my mindset is. My man of God lives in this house. He's moving out of this house. Why would I want to come and get into a house that my pastor is moving out of? Why would I want to do that? So here I am. I'm trying to maneuver myself away from coming to view the home. <laughs> I'm trying to not go and walk through the house when they were showing us the home. When the realtor is showing us the home, I don't, I don't want to go through the house and watch it because of my religion. You don't go through your man of God's house. You don't do this. You don't do that. So I'm trying to walk away from it and push back on it. And my man of God has to take me outside and say to me, son, don't miss your blessing trying to be too spiritual. <laughs> don't miss your blessing trying to be too spiritual. See, here's what God would do. God will send people to help you to make the right choice. Let me say it again. He'll send people around you to help you to make the right choice. See, what you're doing is you're teeter-totting, you're leaning. And God sends somebody along to stabilize you, to encourage you. To take the step. And you're looking at this situation like, but, but Pastor, it's too expensive. But take the step. I, I don't know how we're going to get in. We're going to make ends meet. But take the step. I, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how that's going to work. But you still got to take a step. Because when you take a step, you are taking a step of faith. And every step you take will get better for you. Every step you take, things will work out right for you because God is with you. The Bible said the steps of a good man, they are ordered by the Lord that he delight in his ways. God is the one who's ordering your steps. You got to make a decision. It's up to you now. At the end of the day, even though God sent my man of God to stabilize me, I still had to make the decision. The choice was mine. Here we are. We don't have the money to move into this place, but we believe in by faith that we have it. When I was wavering because they told us, told me we needed all these thousands of dollars at this moment to move in and I didn't have it. Here I am. I called a meeting with the members of my church and asked the members of my church to pray. Not asking you for money, but I'm asking you to pray so we could have the resources and the finances we need to move into this place. Here I am. I'm stressing and here God shows up and God speaks to me and tells me, Son, you don't have to believe me for all of the money at one time. You can believe me in stages. Now, all of a sudden, God stabilizes me. I got a new direction now. I can believe him for this. So all of a sudden now, I got new direction. I got new revelation. I'm believing him from a, from a different perspective now. Now it's time for us to move into the house. <laughs> I believe it was November 4th, 2017. It's time for us to move into the house. We don't have all of the money to go in. We don't have everything that we need. All we got. Is our Lexus full of clothes in the trunk of the car. <laughs> we don't have no furniture to move in with. We leaving all of the furniture in our apartment in Gardena. We're about to move to a five-bedroom house, three, four, four bath, three car garage, <laughs> almost, almost 4,000 square foot of home. We are about to move into it with no furniture. Everything we got is in the trunk of the car. My wife is a witness. My son, Darius Pierre Buckley, is a witness. And we move out there that day. We drive. And we pull up and the lady is waiting on us to give us the keys to the home. And we get out and we walk to the doors. And the lady gives us everything. She unlocks the doors for us. We walk in. My wife is standing there blocking the door. And I'm like, hey, hurry up. We got all these clothes. We got to come on. Hurry up. Hurry up. 
And so here she is. She's crying and got tears in her eyes. I'm like, she is not standing in this doorway crying now. We we don't know. We don't. We got the place now. Your crying time is over. We need to put this stuff in the car. Put this stuff in the house. And as I tried to slide by her, I looked and I saw. I understood why she was standing there crying with her mouth open. It is because we're about to move into a place with no furniture, but God had provided. <laughs> Walked in the doors of the house and. My house is already staged. Pictures all over the wall, furniture in the house. And I'm sitting here looking at this situation like, no, they did not. They get, no, they didn't leave this stuff behind. Maybe they're coming back to get it. Maybe they're coming back to get it. And I'm looking at this stuff, and my son comes out of, out of, out of my office now, but was the media room during that time. He comes running out of there, dad, 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 look, 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 look. We go in there, there's a 55-inch television screen. That's sitting on, <laughs> on the entertainment center. When I looked at it, I said, oh, my God, that's the same 55-inch television screen on the entertainment center that my wife and I saw at Best Buy that I said we was going to buy around January. <laughs> and all of a sudden, now, it's in the house. <laughs> my other son goes to the garage, and he said, Dad, look, look. Go to the garage. There's a refrigerator in the garage. I look at the refrigerator, I say, get out of here. They got to be coming back for this refrigerator because there's no way they left this stuff behind. It's the same refrigerator that I want. The difference is if it's a different color. My wife and I was looking at it at Best Buy. We was going to buy that refrigerator to bring it to the house, to have it brought into the house. But I said, no, let's not buy it now because we're going to have to measure the slot to see if this refrigerator fits. And all of a sudden, we show up at the house and it's in the garage. No, nah, they coming back for this. My wife and I, we, we have been believing God, seeing on the internet this, this California king-size bedroom that we wanted, bedroom set and everything we wanted. While we go upstairs to the master bedroom and open up the double doors, when we open up the double doors, guess what's in there? Everything that we've seen on the internet is in the room in there. And I'm sitting there scratching my head like, no way, no way they got to be coming back to get this stuff. My man of God calls me on the phone and says, son, are you at the house yet? I said, yes, sir, I'm here. He says, well, I'm on my way. I'm thinking they're coming back with a U-Haul to get the rest of the stuff. And he shows up. They're not in a U-Haul, but they in their red SUV. They get up and they come inside of the house. And I said, Dad, where's your, where's your U-Haul at? I was going to help you put the rest of the stuff. He said, we ain't got no more U-Haul. We turned that U-Haul in. I said, well, what are you going to do about all this stuff left in here? He said, son, we, didn't, we, didn't, we, we left this stuff here for you. And I fall back against the wall. Now I got tears streaming down my eyes. I said, why you do that? He says, because you're a part of me, you get what I got. So my entire house is basically staged. Every room got pictures in it. <laughs> Every room got stuff staged in it. I got stuff. I go outside and there's, there, there's lawn furniture in the back. I don't have to pay for it. And I'm sitting here looking at this thing that God is so good. What if I'd have made the decision that we not coming, that I was going to stay in the hood? I would have missed out on everything that God had for us. What if I'd have made the decision that we're not going to do this? What if I'd have made the decision that I wasn't going to sow a seed of $500 to my man of God? I'd have missed out on everything because in the natural, we didn't qualify. In the natural, we didn't have the money. And so but we said, my wife said, are we going to fill out this paperwork? I said, no, because we can't afford it. We don't have the credit score. I said, well, what are we going to do? I like the house. I said, we're going to put a seed in our man of God's hand. On Sunday morning, after our service was over with in L.A., we drove to Chatsworth High School. That was the first Sunday they ever had service in Chatsworth High School. We drove to Chatsworth High School, and after service was over, I put a $500 seed in my man of God's hand, and I told him, my wife likes this house. She wants this house. We don't qualify in the natural, but I believe in the principles. He took my seed, blessed my seed, and prayed over my seed and told me, son, you have the house. And from that day forward, there was no doubt that we would be in this place. No doubt. We knew we, we couldn't get turned down. We knew we couldn't know could not have been given to us. We knew beyond a shadow of a doubt because the plan works. The principles work. The promises work. The purpose work. Everything works. We work the principles and we believe God. But what if we didn't give that $500 seed that morning? Would I be here today? Probably not. It's a choice that you make. The decisions that you make are life choices. They are life decisions. They affect generations. They affect generations. We come out of poverty that day. <laughs> Came into something abundant that day. 
Let me tell you with this, and I got to quit because I'm testifying because I'm trying to encourage people to understand that you have to make a decision. My son and my daughter have been sleeping in the same room, two different beds for years. The first night when it was time for us to go to bed, my son, my son Pierre is there with us. He moved in with us that day. My daughter is in her room. My other son Javon is in his room. And all of a sudden, Javon comes. He knocks on our door. I'm like, yeah, son. He says, uh, I don't know what to do. And I go, what do you mean I don't know what to do? He said, I don't know how to sleep in there. What do you mean you don't know how to sleep in there? Just go get in the bed and go to sleep. He says, no, you don't understand. I have never slept in a room by myself. I don't know how to do this. It was at that moment that I realized that we have been living beneath our privileges all of those years and did not know it. Sometimes you can live below your level of prosperity and not know it because you chose to accept it. And so now all of a sudden, here I am looking at this situation and I'm saying to myself, God, I thank you. I thank you, God, that you pulled us up out of this mess and allowed us to see something totally different and allowed us to experience something different. Thank you for letting my children see something different. Thank you, God. Had I not made that choice, my children would have still been living in a two-bedroom apartment that they would have had to share a bedroom together with. See, you don't understand the decisions that you make. They do more than bless you. They affect the lives of people who are connected to you. Memories are being built because of a decision that you made. The choice is yours. You choose today. <laughs> oh, my God. I could go on and on about this, but, hey, I'm giving you my testimony because I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be motivated. Make your decision in this season of your life. Make a decision that you're going to be happy and not sad. Make a decision that you're going to live a joyous life and not live an unhappy life. Make a decision that you're going to live this joyous life. Make a decision that even in the midst of I might, me not having a job, I'm still going to enjoy my life because God's going to take care of me. If the choice is yours, you choose today. You choose today. You choose today. It's up to you. <laughs> oh, my God. And God has added to us ever since. And I'm grateful. Man, I'm grateful. <laughs> I'm grateful. Listen, I'm getting ready to pray for people today. But listen, I got to give some shout-outs to people. Shout-out to Robert Johnson, who's on Instagram with us, my brother. Thank you so much for being on. Shout-out to Miss Ruth Landaverde, who's on today. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I appreciate you so much for tuning in. Shout-out to Brother Salilo Jones, who's on today. Byron Williams is rocking with us this morning. Good to see you. Miss Latonya Stewart is on today. She beat a bomb. Good to see you, sweetheart. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I appreciate you. You know if I miss you, I'm going to go back and say good morning to you. That's just my style. It's just my thing, all right? So good morning to every one of you today. But listen, I want to pray. I want to pray for you today that you would really make the right choices. And the way you make the right choices is that you make the right choices by getting in this word of God. The word of God will reveal to you what it is you're supposed to do. It'll reveal to you how you should get there. And the word of God will even bring people around you that will encourage you to continue to keep moving. Shout out to Miss Victoria Williams, who's on today as well. Love you, sweetheart. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. Miss Shirley Powell is with us today. Good to see you. Hey, uh, get ready to pray. Um, that you make the right choice. Shout out to my spiritual parents who are watching this morning, uh, Apostle Fred and Pastor Linda Haas. Good to see you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, I hope I wasn't out there too far, you know, because I don't, I don't want my, my parents to call me on the car before being crazy. <laughs> but anyway, we got to pray, and then we're going to release y'all to go, all right? So let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person who's watching me today. I ask in Jesus' name, God, that you would bless them, that you would increase them and add to their lives. Take their lives to another level in you, O oh God. And Lord, I thank you that in this season, God, that you will reveal more of yourself to your people. I ask in Jesus' name, God, that you would help us to make the right choices. Help us, God, to stand firm on your word. Help us not to waver. Help us not to compromise, God, but help us to stay the course because you are a great God. And we thank you for all that you have done for us. God, we thank you for even putting the right people around us who will stabilize us and strengthen us and settle us as we go through this season. And God, I thank you that we will live a joyous life, a peaceful life, a life of happiness. But most of all, God, we will live a life that glorifies you in this season. And Lord, we give you praise for it. Now, Father, I pray for the country beliefs. 
I pray for every Belizean citizen who's watching me today. I ask you in Jesus' name, God, for your peace and prosperity to be over the city now, over the country now. Bless every city in Belize, God. And Lord, I thank you right now that you're blessing the works of the hands of your people there. For every person who's out of work in the country now, God, I thank you that your joy is hitting them. For you said in your word that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So, Lord, I thank you that the country is being strengthened now, even as I pray. Now, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for my town, Itabena, Mississippi. I pray for my town's peace and prosperity. I pray for my town's healing and deliverance. I pray for the grace and mercy to be over my town now. And, God, I thank you right now that unity is upon my town and resources needed to make my town great again is present now. And, God, we give you praise and glory for it. Now, Father, I pray for the Delta as a whole. I pray for your peace and prosperity to flow like a, like a river throughout the Delta. God, I give you praise for it. Now, Father, I lift up pastors all around the world today. I pray for comfort. I pray for strength and peace for them. I pray, God, for supernatural creativity to hit them now. Wisdom like never before to lead their flock in this ever-changing world that we're in today. And I thank you, Lord. I pray for the first responders this morning, God. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, the hedge of protection around them. And, Lord, and I thank you for the wisdom and the boldness. But, God, I thank you for the courageous courage that you've released on them today. For every one of them, God, who's battling the coronavirus, I pray for healing in their body and deliverance in their bodies now in the name of Jesus. And, God, I thank you that it is so even as I pray. And, God, I thank you that all of the materials that they need, God, to continuously do the work that they're doing to save lives will be granted unto them, and it will come expeditiously now. And God, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Hey, do me a favor. Get your seed in the ground today. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, get your seed in the ground. Listen, if you don't have a church home and you want to be a part of you want to connect uh, with, with, with my wife and I, with Pastor Sophia and I, hey, we're building a community of faith. All right. We know that we're in an ever ever changing world right now. We understand that church is not normal anymore. It's not as usual anymore. And so, hey, we're expanding and broadening our horizon today. And hey, we're building a, a community of faith. We're building a, commu a community of faith. And so listen, doesn't matter if you live in another state, doesn't matter if you live in another country, you can become a part of what we do. Connect with us. Be a partner with us. Become a member of what we're doing. Connect with us. I promise you the same grace that's on us is the same grace that will be released on you because of your partnership. You might be saying, well, pastor, I don't go to church. You don't have to be in church right now at this point. No, all of us are shutting down at this moment. You don't need to be in church. You can take church wherever you go just by simply carrying your phone or your computer, your tablet right where you are. We're going to promise you that we're going to pray for you every day. We're going to love on you. We're going to encourage you. We're going to be there for you the best that we can. We're going to do everything in our power to be great pastors to you. So, hey, if you feel led to be a part of this, connect with this. Some of you, your life has been transformed and changed because of your connection to this ministry. So if you want to be a part of what we're doing, hey, you can messenger us. You can email us. Just go to our website at kingdomlifefaithcenter.org and click on uh, the links there. You know, to show you how to connect with us. It doesn't matter if we've never met you personally. Same grace and same glory that's on our lives will be on your life. We will do all that we are supposed to do to encourage you, to love you. But we'll do like our pastor says and not judge you and not point fingers at you because everybody has the right to hear the word of God and you are no exception. So, hey, let us love on you. Connect with us. Let us be your pastors today. Let us be the one who leads you and guides you in this new year, in this 2020 year. Let us be the one to lead you. We'll do right by you. And I promise you we will. So connect with us. If you want to be a part, I'm believing for six new members to join our, to join our ministry this, this, this week. I'm believing God for that. So if you feel led to be one of those ones, connect with us. Be a part. I promise you, we're going to love you. We're going to treat you right. We're going to show you the right way. We're committed to studying this word and to make sure that you are taught this word so your life could be the better. Uh, for those of you who are, who are coming on and watching me because of Miss Shannon Goosby connecting you to me, hey, I appreciate you so much for tuning in. Join in with us. Your life will never be the same. You're, gonna, you, you're connecting yourself with a pastor who's going to give it to you real rough, rugged, and raw. But my messages will be relatable. They'll touch your heart right where you are. I promise you they will. So, hey, do me a favor. Get your seed in the ground today. Go to our website at kingdomlifefaithcenter.org. Click on the online giving button there and get your seed in the ground today. Get your seed in the ground today. Hey, I promise you this is good ground soil. This is not a ministry that has been started by me. But this is a ministry that has been started by God. 
Man, we've been doing out the box ministry since 2017. Who knows? Who knew that you could do ministry from preaching the gospel in your backyard? And look at what God has done. Shout out to my spiritual daughter, Bam, who's on. Her life has been graciously changed because she met a pastor who she found to be real. <laughs> so, hey, y'all connect with me. I'm telling you, it'll be a blessing. So, again, get your seat in the ground. Go to our website. 